Welcome back to Presume Legal. I'm Misha Janice, and this is the recap of Trial Day 17 in the Commonwealth versus Karen Reed case. Grab your red solo cups, pour yourself a nice frothy drink, and let's recap. The first witness on the stand today was Brian Higgins. He was the only witness to take the stand today, and we're not through with him yet. Brian Higgins, prior to becoming an ATF agent, he was a lieutenant with the Canton Fire Department. Although he was a federal agent and continues to be, he worked out of an office inside the Canton Police Department that was offered to him from the former chief of the Canton Police Department, Chief Berkowitz, earlier on the day of the incident, that Friday. He was in New York for a service-related funeral. He traveled back to Massachusetts that afternoon with his good friend, Brian Albert and Kevin Albert and Eddie Hernandez, all police officers or law enforcement. When they got back to Massachusetts, he switched from his service vehicle to his personal vehicle, a Jeep Wrangler that had a six foot plow attached to the front of it. Now he switched cars because he knew that he'd be drinking. He and Albert made plans to meet up at the Hillside Bar and Restaurant. So they went there, had some drinks, and then they made their way to the waterfall where Brian Albert's friends and families were. So Higgins' testimony about his time at the waterfall was consistent with everybody else's testimony. He said he'd known both Karen Reed and John O'Keefe for about a year at that time, and he knew them. He knew that they were a couple. He described his relationship with both of them as friends. He said at the waterfall, he only had a brief conversation with John, like just basic courtesies, and that he did not speak with Karen at all. But he did testify that he sent a flirty text message to her, which was not responded to. He said that when leaving Waterfall, he knew that he was headed to 34 Fairview, a location that he'd been to before, Brian Albert's house, right? He beat Brian home and pulled into the driveway, but then he backed out because he didn't want to get blocked in. So he said he pulled out of his driveway and parked in front of the mailbox. So the back of his Jeep was lined up with the mailbox and the passenger side of his vehicle was facing the house. He went into the house through the side door and described the party inside consistent with other testimony that we've heard. Now, he was asked if he knew Colin Albert. He said he doesn't. He said if Colin Albert came into the courtroom, he wouldn't recognize him. He doesn't know Colin Albert personally, and nobody introduced him to anybody named Colin at the house. At one point, he said Brian Albert took him to the living room to show him pictures of his son who was in the military. Higgins testified that he left 34 Fairview sometime between 1230 and 1. He didn't stay long at all. He was one of the first people to leave. And he attributed that to the fact that he'd had a long day and he was only being offered beer at the house and he wasn't a beer drinker. Uh, while he was at the house, he said he never went anywhere else inside the house, like the basement. He never looked outside the house while he was inside the house, and he never saw John or Karen inside, outside, or around the house at all. At one point, he sent a text message to John um, asking, where are you? But he did not get a reply back from John. When he left the party, he got into his Jeep and pulled out a couple of feet. He realized that the plow on his um, on his Jeep was down, so he raised it up and drove off. He described the mechanics of the plow a bit and said that when he lifted it up, it was only a foot or two up. He had a clear line of sight, and while pulling away, nothing drew his attention. Certainly not anything out of the ordinary on the front lawn of Brian Albert's house. After leaving 34 Fairview, he testified that he went to the Canton Police Department because he needed to move some vehicles. Uh, because there was a storm coming, he needed to rearrange some of the uh, police vehicles that were parked at the police lot. So he went there. He said he went inside 
the building. He waved to Sergeant Good when he passed the dispatch area at the police department where Sergeant Good was was working dispatch. He went to his office to get a, a car key, and then he went back downstairs to move the vehicles. When he finished with that, he drove back home in his Jeep. He wasn't sure of the exact time, but he said it was approximately 1.32 in the morning. When he got home, he said he probably ate something, had some drinks, and he might have laid down on his couch to go to sleep. Next thing he testified was that around 6.30ish, Chief Berkowitz called, but he didn't answer the phone. He said it wasn't abnormal for the chief to be calling him, but that um, Brian Albert then called him too. And when Brian Albert called, he became concerned. He said he had not spoken with Brian Albert since leaving Brian Albert's home earlier that morning. So Brian Albert called, he answered the call and he said that he learned that John had been found on the front lawn. He got dressed, he drove to 34 Ferio. When he got there, he says he doesn't remember what he saw outside. He didn't remember where he parked, but he went right in the house. It was around 7 a.m. He stayed there for less than an hour and said he either went to the police station or back home, but I think his testimony later on solidified the fact that he went to the police station. Uh, next, they jumped to his meeting, a meeting where he met with Trooper Proctor and Trooper Buchanan around February 3rd. He knew Buchanan and Proctor reminded the witness that they too had worked together on a job but he said he didn't remember that he like known and worked with Proctor in the past. So during this interview, he gave the troopers text messages between him and John and the text messages between him and Karen. He gave them to him. He gave the text messages to them in the form of a screenshot. And he said that he wanted to be transparent. That's why he offered this information to them. Buchanan asked whether he had deleted any texts, and uh, the witness said that he maybe had deleted older text strings with John um, that were deleted, you know, a while back. But other than that, no texts were deleted from his phone. We were shown the text change, the, the check. We were shown the text chains. The first of John's texts began on November 4th, and the next, the next to last text was January 16th, with the January 16th text being the one and only time that the witness had gone over to John's house to watch a football game with a group of people. He had gotten a personal invitation from both John and Karen to go over to the O'Keefe house. Next, we were shown the text messages between the witness and Karen Reed, and these went on for a while. The first text between them was January 12th, when she said, hello, and she called herself the Weed Whacker, a nickname she gave herself because of a time that they see, that they saw each other while she was weed whacking in John's yard. The text went on with some banter about how she got his phone number. And then she talked about an invitation to join a group trip to Florida. There's our Florida link, right? Then the text touched on the death of his father and about some girl that he had dated in the past. And finally, Karen invited him to go to John's house to watch that football game. Apparently, the witness was apprehensive about hanging out with a bunch of couples because he was single. So Karen texted him that she and John preferred to hang out with single people because couples never liked each other. We saw another text exchange from the night when he went to John's house where Karen texted the witness that she thought he was quote, hot. Higgins expressed surprise in his text response, but he reciprocated the emotion. 
and told her that he thought she was hot too. The witness said that that night before he left the house after watching football, the defendant walked him out and gave him a quote, romantic kiss. He said he wasn't expecting that from her and he was taken aback. Over the next nine days from the 12th to the 29th, the witness and the defendant sent each other, sent each other text messages. He said he was trying to figure out the reason why she was texting him and what her motive was. Their texts went back and forth. It seemed like Karen was trying to figure out if the witness had any interest in her and his text indicated that he was. He told her that he thought she was hot and smart and witty, but he kept asking why she initially reached out to him. Her texts were a bit evasive, but she did describe herself as single, as in not married. And she wrote that her relationship with John had deteriorated after Aruba because she caught him making out with another girl and it was still weighing heavy on her mind. She expressed regret with that relationship and the responsibility of taking care of these kids who weren't her own. She said she never wanted to have kids. She at one point called them spoiled and said that there's always issues with them. She did apologize for venting to him and invited him for drinks, which he turned down because he said that he didn't have his personal car. She saw that John, she, she, she told Higgins that John saw the ring camera footage of when she walked him out after the football game watch party. And the witness asked if John had seen them kiss. I don't know if he actually saw them kiss because she indicated that she knows where the cameras are placed and she kept saying it wasn't that serious. She basically texted about her philosophy on dating and that each of them were single individuals. So we heard about an incident where Karen went over to Brian Higgins' house. Now this is all happening in between in the month of January, in between that first text message and the 23rd, basically, of January. So in that time, we heard about an incident where Karen went over to Brian Higgins' house. She had been out with a friend in Boston and stopped by his place after. Higgins described her visit as more of the same type of back and forth banter, where he described his purpose was trying to find out what she was up to do. He testified that he didn't want to get used by her to get to John because he actually liked John. And he described her vibe that evening as very weird. We saw the text where the witness said, quote, um, well, to Karen that night at the waterfall. She didn't reply to him, but she did text him the next day around noon when she simply said, John died. And the witness never responded to her. With that, the Commonwealth finished its direct examination of Brian Higgins and the cross examination started. We started his cross by hearing a description of the office that he used at the police department and the access to the different areas in the police department, the Sally Port, which is basically the garage of the police department, the dispatch area, the chief's office. Now he was asked if he still works for the ATF and he said he does, but that he works in division operations and he was taken out of the field. We didn't get to hear an explanation of why he was taken out of the field because of objections, but I have a feeling that this might come up Maybe uh, maybe when the cross-examination is finished because it didn't come up for the rest of the day today. The witness agreed that he was very close friends with Chief, the Chief Berkowitz. And uh, he was very well connected with all the Canton officers because he worked with them. He worked in their building. So, you know, he saw them every day. When asked if at the Chief's retirement party, he, during his toast, said, quote, 
if you want to hide a dead body, the chief is your man, close quote. He said he didn't recall. He was also friends with Brian Albert, who in prior testimony said he socialized together about 50 times in the last two years. They were good friends. He was asked about his relationship with Eddie Hernandez, who he said he's known the longest out of any of the men he traveled back to Boston with that day after leaving New York. And about Kevin Albert, he said that they work together professionally and they also socialize often. The witness said that that Friday at Hillside, he was drinking whiskey and ginger ale, had about four of them. And Brian was drinking as well, but he didn't remember what Brian was drinking. They weren't going round for round. And Higgins wouldn't commit to answer how much Brian Albert had to drink. But they both got in their cars and they both drove separately over to Waterfall after leaving Hillside. Seems like everybody's just drinking and driving in this town, including underage um, individuals. He was asked about the kiss goodbye from Karen. He said it, it wasn't just a peck, despite having called it a, quote, peck in the text messages between them. Today, he really brushed it off as just a figure of speech. He admitted that they never had any physical contact with the defendant other than that one kiss. Defense counsel asked whether he got any answers from her about her motives, and the witness said she never gave him any straight answer. He said he was trying to vet whether her interest in him was legitimate, and he admitted that he was interested and was sexually attracted to her. Defendant's counsel, defense counsel's point, defense counsel's point in this line of questioning was that Karen was non-committal in her interest in the witness. She never expressed any anger or hatred towards John. And that the last time she texted with Higgins was the 23rd, after which she basically ghosted him. Even his text on the 28th while at Waterfalls, where he texted, um, well, that little nudge, she ignored it and she ignored him the entire evening. When leaving Waterfall, Brian Higgins headed over to 34 Fairview. At 1220, he texted John asking if John was gonna come to the Albert house. He confirmed that he parked his car, the Jeep not blocking the driveway, with the tail of his car lined up at the mailbox. His plow was aligned with the front of his car, not angled to the side. In a prior hearing, Higgins testified that he'd never been upstairs. Guys, Brian Albert in this trial testified that he brought Brian Higgins, quote, upstairs to look at his son's military pictures. Remember? Defense counsel insinuated that if Brian Albert brought Higgins upstairs, like Brian Albert testified to, and the pictures that they were looking at were in the living room on the first floor that they must by definition have been coming upstairs from a lower floor, like the basement. So this is why defense counsel has pretty much asked every witness that was at 34 Fairview if they had any interaction with that portion of the house that night. I think every testimony has said that, you know, nobody was down in the basement. Nobody was down in the basement. But did Brian Albert slip up when he said that he brought Brian Higgins upstairs to the living room on the first floor to look at those photos? It's a good question. Higgins was next asked about testimony he gave last year in a hearing when he said that he saw a tall, dark-haired male enter the house. And when he testified, he said that he saw the person come in and stay briefly. Today, Higgins said that he didn't recall if he ever told any investigator about the individual that he saw. He stayed half an hour, definitely less than an hour. He said he didn't tell anybody goodbye. And 
in a prior hearing, he testified that he made a beeline out of there. Today, Higgins said that he'd had a long day and he just wanted to get home. That's why he made a beeline out of there. That's why he was in such a rush. But he didn't actually go home. He went to his office at the police department. He said while walking out of the house, walking to his car, he didn't see anything on the lawn as he drove past the lawn. With his headlights on and no obstruction between him and the lawn, he saw nothing extraordinary out there. When he did get home after leaving the police department, he didn't use his phone that night, so he said. And he said that the first call he received was from Chief Berkowitz just before 7 a.m. So the witness was asked about the two, two phone calls between him and Brian Albert at 2.22 a.m. For one second, a missed call and a return call that he made to Brian Albert 17 seconds later for a 22 second phone call. Now, he reviewed the phone records in front of him, but he denied speaking to Brian Albert in the middle of the night. So we have more mystery middle of the night phone calls between individuals who were at 34 Fairview that night and more denials that anybody spoke to anybody else. Now at a prior hearing, the witness explained the phone calls as butt dials. Here we go again, right? Despite his testimony that he doesn't sleep with his phone on the bed. So how is he butt dialing and his phone is on his night table next to the bed? How is that possible? He said he has no recollection of any calls and he did not speak with anybody. In a different prior hearing, the witness was asked, quote, did you call Brian back? And the witness said, quote, yes, but it's possible the phone picked up on the other end and nobody said anything. And then I terminated the call, close quote. What does that mean? None of this makes any sense. All we know is that there are multiple phone calls, multiple records of phone calls, short phone calls between these individuals, phone calls that were not going to voicemail, that were being picked up, and everybody saying that they didn't speak to anybody else. Was everybody butt dialing in Canton that night? On the 29th, the first person he spoke with that morning was Brian Albert. And the first person he saw was also Brian Albert after driving to his house. He did call Chief Berkowitz back and he said he told the chief that he had been with John the night before at Waterfall and he had been at 34 Fairview, but he never told him about his interest in John's girlfriend or that he had parked close to where John was found or that he had texted John. When he got to 34 Fairview that morning, no investigator asked him to search or investigate or inspect his Jeep, and that never happened to this day. When he pulled up, there was no active scene, but there may still have been a cruiser. He's not sure if he saw one there or not. When he went inside the house that morning, the friends and family discussed the situation. He said he heard Jen McCabe say that the defendant said, quote, I hit him, I hit him, I hit him. But defense counsel argued that his memory was as fresh about that as it was the 2.22 a.m. phone calls. After leaving 34 Fairview that morning, he went to the police station where he stayed most of the day. He wasn't scheduled to work that day. He didn't work that day and he was never assigned to help with the investigation of this case. In fact, he said he didn't remember if he spoke with Brian Albert. He didn't believe he spoke with Kevin Albert, but that he probably spoke with Chief Berkowitz. After he was shown phone records, he admitted that he did have multiple calls with each of those three people. He testified that he didn't remember any of the conversations with any of them, but
but he absolutely denied that he relayed information that he gained from Kevin Albert, a Canton police officer, or Chief Berkowitz, the chief of police, of Canton Police Department. He didn't relay any information that he got from them to Brian Albert. He knows that definitively. He testified about the access log records from the police department that showed him accessing the Sally port, that's that garage there, about 90 minutes before Karen Reed's vehicle was brought there. He said he didn't see anything like red Solo cups or brown grocery bags full of other evidence in the Sally port when he went through it. Records show that the witness was in the Sally port at 407, but he said he didn't remember seeing Chief Berkowitz in the Sally Port at that point or any time until the SUV was delivered there. He also didn't remember when he left the police station. The car was delivered at 536. He said he didn't think he was there still. He's got some serious lapses of memory of what he did that day or where he was that day. So. Karen Reed's car was delivered to the Sally Port at 536. We learned that the video surveillance from the Sally Port garage at the police department at 536 when the car was delivered, it's missing. Right. At 612, Brian Albert called him. And at 616, Chief Berkowitz called the witness. The witness denied that those were the calls advising him that taillight pieces had now been found at 34 Fairview. He was interviewed by Trooper Proctor and Buchnick a few days after the incident. And after having numerous conversations with everyone involved, and access to the officers at Canton PD, as well as the Sally Port and anything within the Sally Port. On February 4th, the chief called the witness to tell him that he personally found taillight pieces at 34 Fairview. The witness and Brian Albert spoke immediately after Higgins spoke with the chief. And yeah, they discussed the taillight but he adamantly denied that he funneled any information that he had just learned from the chief to Brian Albert. The witness was asked about data removal from cell phones. He admitted that he asked his best friend, who was also a federal special agent, for a method to get information off his cell phone so that he could provide it to the state troopers. The witness admitted that he could have simply provided his entire phone to the investigators for them to image the whole thing and get the phone back, but it was not the option that he chose. He said he and his federal government friend went to a kiosk inside a federal facility, the, um, the FBI crime lab or something like that, to use a machine to download or extract his phone contents. So at that point, the council took a sidebar and the jury stepped out. Next thing we know, William Connolly, Brian Higgins' personal attorney, came in the courtroom to listen to an offer of proof from the defense. Defense, call, co defense counsel argued that the witness used federal resources for personal gain because he used a federal agent for advice, utilized a federal facility, and used federal resources, the machine that read his cell phone, all for his personal gain so that he could, as a witness, download information from his cell phone in anticipation of turning that curated and sanitized information over to investigators so that he was later able to ultimately destroy his phone. When the jury came back in, the witness was asked whether he knew that it was a crime to use federal resources for personal gain and whether he knew that federal employees are not allowed to use their position for personal purposes. He said he was not. 
The witness said his friend walked him through the process of how to pull the, the text messages of his conversations with John and Karen off of the phone. When asked where the rest of his phone information was, he answered that he no longer had that phone. Y'all, he testified that he threw his phone away. He was asked whether he received the court notice not to alter, destroy, or manipulate his phone. He admitted he received it, but he said that the day before he received that notice, mm, he changed phone carriers and phone numbers. Yeah. He admitted that he thereafter removed the phone SIM card and threw it away, but he didn't do that until after the preservation order was denied. And on that note, in the middle of this line of questioning, and already over the time she allowed the defense to continue, the judge ended the day. So we'll be back next Tuesday after the long holiday weekend. Tuesday will be the only trial day next week, and it should be good because we'll get the rest of the Higgins cross-examination and hopefully get to another witness as well. So I hope you have a fabulous weekend. There's lots to chew on here. I'll see you back on Tuesday. Thanks for hanging out with me. Until the next drop, peace.